Well, Darren uh, mentioned that uh, that I uh, spent uh, time with uh, OSU, and one of the uh, elements of a university career is the fact that you can take uh, sabbaticals, and uh, they pay you part of your salary, and you got to find somebody else to help pay for your salary. But I took a sabbatical with the Norwegian Forest Research Institute in '89 and '90 and looked at the very topic we're talking about in another country and in another culture and had opportunities to find out how things worked under their systems. And that was extremely instrumental in bringing back some of the technologies here to the west coast of the U.S. And that uh, then uh, started uh, or intensified the mechanized operations interest that I had. We, in the forest engineering uh, academic field always have to uh, remark that uh, mention of trade names doesn't constitute a, an endorsement and I'm so ingrained by that uh, that goes for me as well even as a consulting forest engineer uh, if I mention a name that doesn't mean that they're better than the rest of the outfits that will uh, produce a similar product so and then again I'm not representing Oregon State or anybody else it's just the, the views that I have so uh, we'll talk about first the systems uh, associated with, uh, with mechanized harvesting, and I hate to do this to you, but we have to get some concepts out of the way and some definitions. That's always, for me, a little painful because the real interest is, like you saw in the little videotape, the machines where they're moving and you can see what's happening, but sometimes it's necessary. So we'll get uh, some of the systems thinking out of the way. First thing I think it's useful uh, to talk about the uh, types of uh, methods that we have. And uh, one of those that I identify is biomechanical. And uh, usually uh, people think about this as sort of the uh, backwards way of doing things. It's human and animal power, uh, hand tools, uh, leverage. Uh, you modify some equipment to, to make it work, but it's mostly physical power of, of uh, animals that are, including us, doing the energy force. But uh, exposed uh, to some of this, when I looked back at our past, I came on the concept that we have a notion of high-tech biomechanical logging. Uh, the people who did this 100 years ago had the high technology for their time, and it made perfect sense uh, the way they were operating to consider that high-tech. And I'll give you a little example of that. So there is high-tech biomechanical logging uh, as well, and we'll see what that is. We think of motor manual uh, systems or methods, which are sort of motorized hand tools and usually single function equipment. And that's a skidder that just pulls the logs uh, to the landing. It's a chainsaw that cuts the tree and delimbs the tree and so forth. Uh, that's generally termed motor manual, where we have the, the uh, uh, tools in the hands of the operators pretty much in a single function. There's a little bit of a scattered break in here where we have uh, mechanized operations. And there the worker is the machine operator, but they're doing less with their own mechanical power uh, to carry out the function. Uh, combustion engine is usually the power source uh, for that activity. And so mechanized is where the workers operate the machines. And we have automated uh, methods in which the worker initiates a automatic sequence of activities. This is most typically found on our harvesters that once you position the stem in a uh, uh, delimbing uh, component, that you just push a button and then the machine does the rest of it automatically. You don't have to pay attention to it uh, directly. The rest of it's done by the machine. And that's an automatic, automated work uh, action. We also, uh, if you look at the, the uh, right-hand side, have uh, remote control operations. And this is an operation in uh, Sweden. Uh, this uh, machine here is called, affectionately, if I can find them again, The Beast. Uh, and that uh, machine is operated by the forwarder operator here uh, remotely. And they'll have two forwarders that will come in. And while they're on site uh, combined and loading the logs and so forth, they'll also operate the beast, cutting trees and processing timber. 
and because the felling function uh, is a lot faster than the forwarding function, they can uh, run a few loads uh, felling and then head to the uh, uh, landing with their load on the forwarder and the uh, next operator will come and take over and do the same. And so they don't need an operator on the felling machine in that case. There's a variety of savings that go with that. And then finally, we have autonomous uh, machine operation. And there you have operator guidance or human supervision. And this uh, was initiated in 2000 in one of the major equipment shows uh, in uh, the Scandinavia. But the, uh, the reality of it is that it hasn't exactly uh, caught a hole completely. And all of the technical bugs aren't worked out. But they do have autonomous machines that will go out along pre-arranged uh, tracks with global positioning systems uh, where piles are located and they will pick up the piles, load them on a, a forwarder and bring it back to a landing and unload it at a prescribed place. Uh, they also have uh, some uh, site preparation equipment that is completely autonomous. So uh, that uh, uh, is not too far uh, out into the future. And I guess uh, in many respects, uh, the most exciting one that we have is the psycho-cybernetic uh, methods that were coming forward. And uh, that's where you have an intelligent being thinking about the work and assuming it will be done. Some of the people I know in agencies are like that. I had a lot of administrators in the university that were psycho-cybernetic uh, operators. Uh, and uh, sometimes the environmental wishful thinkers are that way, not realizing that there's a lot between thinking about it and when it happens. And I find that myself uh, operating that way when I ought to be mowing the lawn on a Saturday. So there's our methods. When all is said and done, there are a whole variety of methodologies that we can use uh, that would be considered mechanized harvesting operations. And it depends in part on what we produce, uh, the end product. If we're producing uh, uh, logs that are going to be used in, in wood uh, processing, whether we're going to be producing bundles uh, that are going to be uh, uh, stored for uh, uh, conversion into energy, whether we're doing uh, chips for paper or hog fuel, or whether we're just producing a, uh, a uh, forest that has the uh, characteristics we want. All of those products are uh, the driving mechanisms for our systems of mechanization. And the more exciting ones now are in the biomass area and even the, the uh, small scale uh, uh, wood fuel uh, plants that uh, may, be, uh, may be in our futures. Who knows? We're, we're ways away. So those are the methods in general terms. We have to talk about action as well. That's uh, important. When we break these uh, things we do in our work environment, we have to break them down into discrete uh, components that we can talk about. And the first one we do is talk about jobs and maybe the sub-jobs. Okay, everybody knows you're a harvester operator and one of your sub-jobs is to do the fouling activities. Okay, pretty clear on that. But sometimes we have to take it further and uh, break it down into tasks and subtasks. So one of the tasks that you do as a harvester operator is to cross-cut the stem. And a subtask of that might be positioning the stem so that you get accurate measurements on the stem as it's processed. So we have tasks and subtasks among the jobs. Sometimes there is a cycle to the work. We cut down a tree, we process it, we go to the next tree. So that becomes a work cycle. And so we measure these in cycles. So cutting a tree is one cycle. Taking a turn of logs uh, from the woods to the landing and back again, or starting out empty is the way we usually do it. Going to the woods, picking up a turn of, of logs, a drag of logs, bringing them back to the landing. That's a work cycle. And it has a bunch of tasks and subtasks associated with it. And then we have sometimes very discrete elements uh, that we use for studying these uh, tasks that are part of a, of a uh, time study activity. Sometimes we're really interested in the harvester operator is just the mechanism of positioning the boom on the head. 
And if we study that with time study, sometimes we get insight as to how that can be done more efficiently. We call that an element. And these work elements then are more finely tuned components of action. Then we have to have some concepts of uh, production. And these uh, concepts of production uh, involve uh, what we're going to do with our, our uh, physical activities. We produce volumes, for example. No question. It could be other kinds of things. We could count the logs, count the loads, measure the tons, look at the acres. We have some idea of the physical output that we're doing by production. For a trucking, it could be loaded miles that we're measuring. If we're doing energy, it could be bundles or BTUs uh, as a concept of production. And sometimes we add the quality dimension to that production, things like the grades. If we could get more saw logs of particular grades, that may be better than something else. The values. Or we measure the quality conditions of the land as part of the production. The resource conditions, if it's something like uh, leaving standing wood for uh, uh, snags as a habitat. All sorts of measurements. But we've got to have some idea of what we're really producing. We oftentimes think about uh, the outputs, the forest products, and the processes that we're trying to, to, to generate by our work activities. And it's important to think about them in a couple of different terms. And this uh, graph helps me do that because it puts things in relative perspectives for us. If we take the production of solid wood products, saw logs, and we use that as a base uh, for our, our analysis, we find that our harvesting and transport costs may run 40-50% of that mill delivered price for that product. Okay, That's 100%. Sometimes we luck out and we get some really high value products. On the East Coast they get uh, uh, one cherry log. You could you could uh, spend a whole day just to get that out of the woods without damaging it because there's a German buyer that's going to pay you 2000 bucks uh, for that log when it hits the landing. Well, not everybody has those, but we have things like poles that we do for that. There are other high-value products in which the harvesting and transport costs are a relatively smaller proportion of that total cost. Then we have some other lower-value products where the harvesting and transport costs almost take up the whole mill delivered price. There's still some value there for pulp or, or uh, chips or whatever it might be in a particular uh, market condition, but you only have a little bit left over uh, of that mill delivered price. What happens in some of our activities, like in energy, uh, we don't have as much uh, uh, margin there and it'll take all of the costs uh, of harvesting and transport to produce it. Plus, we may have to even pick up a little bit of subsidy in order to make it work. Then finally, we have forest treatments in which uh, there is no marketable end product and it all is a cost output and may in fact have to be a, a subsidy in order to get the job done. Important to keep these in mind because they drive our, our mechanized <coughs> operations for sure, any harvest operation, as to what you can actually do. Sometimes people get ahead of themselves with wishful thinking. And I've been with the energy uh, uh, area before. We had a 1973, 74, 75 crisis in energy, and we were able to do a lot of things in the woods that we could never do before with whole tree chipping and the like. And, tremendous uh, uh, utilization of flash materials and terrific uh, forest operations, but the markets didn't stay at that same level and we were back doing things differently in a short time. We may be into this business uh, again. Hopefully, it'll be a little more effective. So we've got our products. We've got a way of thinking about the relative cost of these products. Then you have to have what's it take to do it. Of course, it takes labor. We have to have the capital and the machine costs that we use. We can measure that in energy, uh, the fuel, the calories of, of humans. It takes the resources, land and timber, uh, to be able to do that. It takes the management, the intellectual capital, uh, the computer technologies that we use to plan this stuff. We have to have markets uh, that are, we can access. So it takes the management activity. 
all of this is based on the concept of time because time is a measure that we can get a handle on. We can relate time to money in many cases. So for our forest operations, we have a fairly elaborate uh, description of the time components. And that's what you have in these next few slides and what you have on your chart uh, in your book. Everything is broken down. But as we step through this, we start out with a total amount of time that we're uh, going to consider, and that can be calendar time. We've got the non-workplace time. The uh, non-workplace time is made up of several components, uh, things like travel time and so forth. Once we're at the workplace, however, and we have the time allocated for work, that becomes an important number for us uh, relative to time. And we call that schedule time. And when we relate it to machines and systems, we call it scheduled machine hours. Because that's the number of scheduled machine hours we want our operations to work. You go beyond the schedule time, you've got a whole bunch of things that don't work out. So you've got disturbances in the system. The disturbances in the system are uh, what we typically call delays in many cases. And so you can have delays that are related to the work. You could have uh, uh, interference from, uh, from uh, visitors. Uh, you could have uh, a, a whole series of delays that, that come into play. Uh, once you've got those delays and you're actually working, you have a portion of that work time that is productive work time. And that's when the machines and the system is actually working uh, to produce something. And that, when we talk about hours, is productive machine hours. And that's where we often have to have that number in mind, and they're usually not the same thing. Sometimes the productive machine hours for a mechanized operation may be only 65% of the scheduled machine hours because of delays, breakdowns. You'll see the, the list. And then finally, uh, we can break this uh, productive work time down into the time we're spent uh, preparing for the site, relocating from site to site, planning, etc. Uh, changing, changing operations, setting up, taking it down. All of these fine distinctions keep flowing down. The uh, repair time, the service time, the maintenance and so forth all finally break down so that we can identify where the time is being spent on the operation. All of our efficiency measures in, in most respects uh, come about so that we understand the concept of time and how we use it. And that's what a, sort of what this uh, concept is about. So we have our, our systems in mind. We have our ideas of production and the inputs. And now we've got time. The uh, next period of time is a little larger. And that is uh, when we're talking about running businesses where we have to have a monthly time schedule for payrolls, receivables, etc. Uh, it's not just the minutes that count, it's what you do at the end of the month if you've got any money in the bank. You have an operating season that counts, and that's uh, oftentimes uh, reflective of your scheduled uh, machine hours, but sometimes it's cut short. Uh, snow, uh, weather, whatever may make that uh, much more different. And then if you're really thinking about it, you've got to have some kind of an annual budget period where you're going to try to make things work out so when you pay your taxes like you did yesterday, you're, you're done with it for the period. We also have a concept of space, and we look at space in a couple of different ways as well. I guess the first thing is to look at from the seat of the machine. Uh, what you have is an XYZ axis on the basis of the machine, and the x-axis is if you're going out somewhere, you know, you're making progress. The uh, y-axis is if you're going zigging and zagging, you know, you get too much of this. And then your z-axis, if you're bouncing around, uh, you're getting a motion that way. And so that's how we measure those elements on an operation when we're looking at something like whole body vibration for machine operators and try to keep that down to something that makes, uh, makes sense. In addition, uh, 
we have the GPS concept. That is to say, our position on the landscape. We can know, for example, the GPS coordinates of this uh, residual tree right here. Uh, that's helpful maybe when we're starting to plan our operation or uh, want to be sure that that's one that we protect by our other operations of uh, felling and, and so forth. So we look at it in that kind of a terrain uh, relationship. More extensively, we look at it from a GIS standpoint, the aerial locale where we're operating, and then we start seeing different uh, definitions of topography and terrain type and soil form, timber type, etc on that terrain area. And then finally, we end up going way up to timber sheds. That is uh, the concept of the timber and area that would logically flow uh, down a particular highway route or market route or whatever we might be talking about. All of these uh, concepts are related to some notion of feasibility. Our uh, concepts of feasibility are in part uh, defined by how we think about things, I guess. As an engineer, I really recognize the technical feasibility. Uh, the laws of physics, the engineering concepts that we put into place are really very strong, immutable laws. You're not going to get away from gravity for a while, as far as I know. And that's going to cover everything we do. Even our biomass uh, stuff is heavy uh, for what we have to transport for the energy we get because half of it's water. So we can't get around that. And these technical laws, if you can't solve them, uh, you're, uh, you're in trouble. These technical laws apply to the forest ecosystems as well. And they are the laws of physics that govern the way forests grow and operate. And the, the laws that we can determine and they're relative to the way trees grow and how they behave. We'll talk more about that with something like soil compaction. Physical processes are at work that we have to understand. So it's got to be technically feasible to work. It's also got to be economically feasible. And these economically feasible things are related to a structure of supply and demand uh, that we've got. Uh, we can't produce something that somebody doesn't want and expect to get paid for it. That's uh, a very strong condition. It's even that way in the, uh, in the socialist uh, democracies or even the communist system. Uh, you know, if they didn't have a demand for the left shoes that people produced at one factory versus the right shoes at another, uh, they were stuck with a lot of people hopping around. It involves prices and costs. We, uh, we, we have... Uh, a system where we are extremely concerned with price and cost. And that's okay. It makes for efficiencies in our operation. Uh, so we have to be very much aware of that. Nobody wants to be the high cost producer in a low cost marketing, uh, a low price marketing arrangement. And the Nordic countries, for example, find themselves in that situation. They have very high costs and the world of forest products is set at a global level. There's also the question is about distribution of economic uh, gains and equity of those gains. And oftentimes you find disparities in the economic feasibility there. That is, uh, someone does the work, produces the, uh, the benefit, and somebody else gets credit for it, or somebody else uh, receives the gain for that. Those kinds of systems are not technically feasible for very long. Pretty soon people say, hell, if, uh, if you're going to if that's the way it's going to work, I'm just not going to do it, you know. Or you got to pay me for what I'm doing, you know. You can't, you can't just ask me to do something for nothing, you know. I, I shouldn't be subsidizing you, for example. So these equity questions become really critical too, as part of economic feasibility. Finally, and probably even the ones that we deal with most annoyingly, so are the institutional feasibility concepts. That is to say, the laws and regulations that govern our actions. And it's not just the ones that are written down. It's the laws of the institution that are never written down, but are in the mind of the manager or in the mind of the, the contractor. You know, as a worker working for somebody, you got to know what the other guy is thinking, you know, before you can operate effectively. It involves organizational approval and the human systems that we work in. So unless all of these technical, economic, and institutional feasibility concepts work, it's not likely to last very long and not likely to be feasible. 
We have some other concepts that we like to look at as well besides the uh, uh, feasibility issues are the efficiency measures. And efficiency measures come in a variety of forms, but the one that's most commonly uh, identified is productivity. And that's a very general term uh, where we just take the outputs and divide them by the inputs. They could be anything. It can be money terms, the amount of money that we get out of the operation versus the amount of money that we put in on it. That's a relationship. We can do it with energy, the amount of energy that we produce in the product versus the amount of energy we put into it. All of those are productivity measures, and we can define those however we want. They give us some idea of efficiency of our operations. There's another measure that's called effectiveness, and it's less, uh, less defined because uh, you, uh, you define that as well, but it, it may be something like profit, okay? You may have a, a need and a desire for profit, uh, it might be utilization. That is to say, uh, the, the ability to use all of your economic resources for the, for the time period, make them fully utilized rather than having a bunch of them sit idle. It might be season length, so that you might have an effective measure to say, if we could just increase our operating season one month, we would be really much better off. Then there's quality measures, a whole host of them. I don't need to tell you what they are. They can be uh, uh, everything from damage to the residual stand to the uh, uh, damage to logs uh, during handling uh, as part of the quality issues. We measure return on investment in some of our financial uh, measures of effectiveness. Uh, we measure growth uh, of our, of our uh, business. Uh, if we're declining versus growing our business, it makes a difference. Uh, we measure things like market share and a whole bunch of others that are whatever you want to look at for a kind of business operation. These efficiency measures are things that we consider as well. In order to get something done, we have to do some planning. And I've had lots of discussions with planners. Many of my economics friends are harvest schedulers and they are planners of the nth degree. But they sometimes forget that a plan at its heart is a statement of intended actions. If you're going to plan for the sake of planning, have at it. But it's just an exercise. Planning is a statement of intended actions. And that then becomes the point where if you're just planning in your mind, it's vaporous. You know? Uh, you're just thinking about things. That's not the same as planning. Planning is a real commitment to intended actions. That's why we talk about making those plans visible and then they become useful uh, if that's the case with uh, planning. Planning has, uh, plans have milestones, timetables, checkpoints. If you're gonna implement the plan, you measure along the way. And then finally, uh, the plans have some feedback loop in it so you don't just keep going on in the same direction uh, I work with a lot of logging contractors who are having financial troubles, and sometimes they work harder to go broke faster, and that's not a good way to do business, because at the heart of it, plans also change, and that's the concept of planning. We have plans uh, at different levels as well. Here's one that, that ought to give you some personal uh, insights, and that is the notion of a trajectory of development. Everybody's on one. Uh, you're somewhere along uh, these, uh, probably these two uh, categories uh, of a trajectory. Uh, if you take uh, an idea of some potential, sometimes people measure it by income. That isn't a good measure, but if you've got some idea of potential, and you measure it over the age of the individual, and you look at, let's take a worker that's uh, from a developing country, and I've seen lots of these overseas, where the worker uh, starts working at about uh, six years of age uh, and then uh, gets up to around 20, peak out, and then something happens. Uh, in Africa, it would be AIDS. Uh, they hire three times as many workers as they need at the start of the season, and then uh, the worker uh, terminates. Or even under other regular countries, the lifespan in Tanzania is about 45. So, and that's without the AIDS, uh, before the AIDS epidemic. So we have workers that are limited. This could be a drug user in the, in the US having an accident, you know. Uh, our typical workers 
progress a little slower and then continue to grow and then sort of decline uh, with age. Um, that's not necessary. Uh, we can have high performance workers by investing in training, investing in personal development, and we find lots of workers who uh, work very late in life uh, uh, with very high levels of performance. But it's the concept that this is part of your lifespan and life cycle and the people who work for you. The guy on the skidder has this kind of trajectory. Uh, the guy cutting timber uh, has a, a life cycle. And we often don't recognize that when we use the concept of labor as a factor of production. Firms have a uh, concept uh, that deals with uh, trajectories. This happens to be the trajectory of a Western, uh, Western Oregon uh, uh, logging firm and I tracked them uh, from the 70s up until uh, about uh, uh, 2000. I lost track of them and then uh, a tragedy occurred here in 2004. They had been accident free for a lot of years and then in a tragic incident uh, one of the cutters uh, fell a tree on one of the owners and that uh, firm's trajectory is uh, wildly different now and they had an idea of what their trajectory, what they wanted it to be, but they hadn't figured in catastrophes or catastrophic events, nor had they looked at succession uh, for the firms themselves. And so they were pretty torn up. They're back on their feet again, reconfigured. But that particular firm uh, was on a pretty good trajectory. They didn't make a lot of money during the tough years, but they were back working again. Uh, but every firm, an organization has such a trajectory. And even further, uh, what prompted my concept of trajectories was the one that I saw for the Nordic countries. Sweden has, uh, as an example, has chronicled all of their developments in the harvesting operations area uh, over time and tracked that against uh, person day uh, productivity. And so that's their uh, trajectory of development for their forestry sector in, uh, in Sweden. And uh, so I thought that looked pretty good. So I made one for the Pacific Northwest and found that we had uh, very high uh, uh, productivity for a lot of years until we ran into the uh, decline in timber size and the decline of uh, log uh, of aerial, uh, not aerial from the helicopter to balloon, but the amount of area available for harvest. We now have gone down and we're starting to climb back up. I just haven't got those figures plotted on this trajectory. But every sector, you know, where we're talking about the Utah sector, the Colorado sector, the Intermountain sector, has this kind of a trajectory uh, as well. So we've got trajectories for individuals, firms, and even whole forestry sector uh, units. The planning concepts are aerial in, in extent as well. Uh, we have uh, strategic plans that often cover large areas that we're trying to, to, to deal with uh, in a uh, fairly holistic kind of way, but without a lot of detail perhaps. We have tactical plans that have a lot, of, a lot more detail and may operate uh, in, a, let's say, a watershed uh, area for a given year. And then finally, we have our unit, our operational area planning that has to take place. So planning has time dimensions, and space dimensions that we talked about earlier. Well, we're into this course now. We've uh, got our systems uh, thinking and methods down. We'll be talking in just a little bit about systems and the machines that we're going to be doing, working with. We'll deal a little with this optimization of uh, value from the uh, uh, trees and stems that we harvest. We'll talk about the resource impacts, operator safety and health, training and supervision, the costing, and then uh, we'll hit the logger budget example, uh, which has the, uh, the uh, cost uh, calculations along with uh, tackling productivity, where we'll deal with the five Bs uh, of uh, productivity. And we'll deal with special operations. And then finally, questions, discussions, our uh, summaries, certificates, etc. Any questions or comments about the generalized uh, concepts that we've gotten into? Well, that one firm where you're showing their trajectory of a bunch of uh, accidents, 
See, like up to about 1960, they experienced quite a few and then had that one fatality. Yeah, what they, was they, going on prior? Well, uh, prior was sort of business as usual. And then, uh, uh, and I don't remember the, the time period, but in the uh, early uh, uh, 80s, uh, the Oregon Safety Code, instead of emphasizing a, uh, a code that was uh, based on specific rules of do this, don't do that, you know, like broken windows on machines and so forth, the code went after a safety and health management approach to firms. And that meant that the firms had to put together training plans for people. People had to be trained to do the work that they were supposed to be doing. And the inspectors actually inspected on that and asked people about their training and so forth. That, I think, is part of that reflected with that firm. Plus, uh, you'll see in a little later uh, slide that we have on the labor force, the cost of workers' comp insurance got very high. And that became an economic driver as well. Uh, so that uh, one accident, a bad accident, would just about bankrupt the firm. And if it happened to a key operator, you were really in trouble. So all of those things come into play. But that firm uh, is back doing business and is uh, going ahead pretty well now. But a tragedy, of course. So anything else? Well, why don't we stand up and take a little bit of a five-minute break or so and use the restroom if you have to, and we'll start up at the next, next point.